don't really drink Red Bull for um, the caffeine. I drink it for those extra chemicals like taurine, the super synthetics that are that are man-made and have nothing to do with anything natural. You know, the stuff that they put in rocket engines and okay. you know the yeah. stuff they use like for silicon lubricants for mining equipment. That's in here. Oh, that you know. great. There's some insecticide stuff. <laughs> That you can only get in North Korea, yeah. Korean soda pop, and this, you know, so. <laughs> At least I have my health in front of me. <clears throat> um, and it's, and it's, Shelly include all of this. Um, it's also like uh, when they clean up beers. You know, and they make them naturally, and it's manufactured organically with only organic and natural ingredients. I miss the taste of the nuclear waste. <laughs> I miss the taste of uh, the uh, the inferior toxic ingredients and the, uh, the buzz a little better. you know the stuff that's all bad for me. Or am I imagining the taste of that? Yeah. There's a taste of something yeah. that's in Budweiser that's not in, uh, what should we call it, that's not in some Vermont microbrewery that has, you know, an all green bottle with an all green label. There is definitely a place for that, but, um, you know, the, the original gateway drug is Budweiser, an ice cold Budweiser where it's so cold and it's like July or August, right? And there's, and like Hemingway says, you gotta see the tears or the sweat on the side of the wine bottle. Well, I don't know much about wine bottles. If it doesn't have a freight train on, on the label, you know, <laughs> or the name of a person like St. Bob's. <laughs> Or a screw top, I don't know, or a brown paper bag so you can hold it right in the middle and it doesn't slip out of your hand at the company picnic. I don't know about wine, whatever. But uh, ice cold Budweiser on a July afternoon on the 4th of July picnic, right? And uh, roasting corn and barbecue is there. And uh, a Marlboro cigarette, the red and white cowboy one from the cowboy commercials when they rode, you know, directly towards the camera before, you know, the, an entire nation of people uh, rose up and said, stop showing that shit to my kids, you know. And it, hey, it has an, it has an impact. Um, I remember watching uh, Sean Connerably, uh, Sean Connerably, arguably, the best of Blade, James Bond of Blade ever from Goldfinger, 1967, went to see it. I think it was on my birthday or somebody's birthday and sat through it twice. And, uh, you know, he smokes Rothman's king size cigarettes. He also drinks uh, dry martini shaken, not stirred. I never got to that kind of hard booze. I never got past Jack Daniels. And why would you want to? We'll discuss that in a second. But um, uh, I immediately went out and shoplifted a pack of uh, Rothman's King Size, the blue and white package. It comes in red and white as well, but James Bonnerably doesn't smoke the red and white kind. He smokes the blue and white Rothman's King Size in Goldfinger. And uh, it started me on a, uh, a great habit there. I even have a James Bond suit over there. We've talked about James Bond. Bond. Some people look in the mirror first thing in the morning and go, Bob, Bob Wilson, insurance executive. And I look in the mirror and I go, Bond, James Bond. <laughs> it's a mindset thing. I do understand you know, the reality of things here. But reality of things is not why you've checked in to Roth World. DavidLeeRoth.com. We the bomb.
my own personal history with alcohol is something that comes up frequently. And when we discuss the history of uh, alcohol, um, you know, we got to go all the way back to the gateway drugs. And the gateway drug is not marijuana. Most people, I got to imagine, who smoke marijuana for the first time have already tried one of the gateway drugs, which is ice cold Budweiser. It's better if it's ice cold. And uh, a Marlboro cigarette. Well, for me, it was Marlboro cigarettes. Also, we had, in, at some point in the 70s, there was, it was what kind of man smokes camel, or there was a whole series of a fella who was all over the world. He was on draw bridges and suspension bridges. He was standing next to elephants looking at a map in a broken down Jeep somewhere in the Sahara. Then he was up on the mountaintop, you know, dressed like a, an Eskimo who I know, they don't live in the mountains, but it was a great ad. And he was always smoking a camel cigarette. And the story behind it was that the fella who was creating the ad campaign and uh, determining all these different world travels, which in the 70s was considered very extravagant compared to today. Um, it was the same guy. The advertising fellow who designed the campaign was actually the guy in the campaign, and he was flying himself all over the world. And, um, uh, you know, uh, the closest I could get to that is probably, how old was I? I was probably about 13 years old, something like this closest I can get to anything like that. I can't afford a Jeep, but I could sure afford a pack of Camel cigarettes. And this is kind of how you start thinking, uh, at least when you're David Lee Roth uh, as a little guy. You know, how far back does this go? I remember the songs from beer commercials more readily than I remember the songs from soda pop commercials. And I'm going to imagine that a lot of this has to do with the, uh, maybe it's a fact or it could be a fact, it, it's a good story, let's agree on this much, that um, uh, alcohol sales outsold soda pop sales for a long time, maybe just because advertising was not attendant to the youth market for many, many years. It was just, you know, this is how we do it, this is how we've always done it, etc. And, uh, you know, selling adults, not only an adult beverage, but you're selling somebody a vacation in a can. <laughs> you're selling somebody a vacation in a bottle. Because you can be sitting in a tiny little apartment, speaking of which, and, uh, you know, you crack a bottle of whatever or a couple of cans of whatever, and uh, suddenly you're not here anymore. <laughs> you smoke yourself a menthol, mentholated cigarette somewhere. You're, you're someplace a lot more uptown or downtown as the case may require. And with that in mind, you can certainly charge more. And with charging more comes advertising. And so, you know, growing up with from the land of sky blue waters, I, I think that's Ham's beer was the one from the land of sky blue waters. From the land of sky blue waters, from the land of pines, lofty balsams, comes a beer refreshing, Ham's a beer refreshing. Mmm, Ham. Coors today, uh, you know, uh, represents something a little bit different than it did growing up. Growing up, Coors, the regular Coors can was the college drink. That was the fraternity brothers drink. The idea that you had to send somebody across state borders if you had to, a la something like out of a movie. They all took to the road one day for a quiet little drive in the country. Georgia to Texas and back in 28 hours flat with a truckload of bootleg beer. Now, who would do a thing like that? <laughs> it was the drink that carried with it that connotation. And then, of course, that connotation, because a lot of people, at least coming out of the 60s and 70s, you know, college for many, 
was just a way of extending high school for another three to four years. <laughs> and that being said, why would you be doing that? Because it was more vacation-like, and if school was more vacation-like, times equals to move the decimal point, then vacation extends to being like school, and of course we're going to drink the same thing. So Coors became the Lake Havasu drink, the Lake Mead drink. The Are you guys going to the river? Uh, on the break this time, are, are, on spring break, are you guys going down to the beach? You going to Fort Lauderdale? Um, it's uh, are you know on, uh, over the vacation? Are you guys going to the canyon, the valley? The, you know it, the the list is long and infinite, and um, you would of course drink Coors. You know this I knew long before I was able to actually drink Coors. Before. <laughs> I knew about this stuff long before, like I knew about the Beatles long before I ever heard about them. I don't know, just from reading and, you know, the dentist office, waiting room magazines, watching uh, Huntley Brinkley on television, they, and, uh, you know, general talk on the radio or whatever. Those were about the only three places that you would find any kind of uh, what's happening now in the village, what's happening culturally, you know, in the community, so to speak. But uh, I knew about all the, I knew about all of these things long before I was able to actually go into a liquor store and slap a five on the counter, so to speak. Um, today, you know, folks, for example, like gun owners, yes, in general, gun owners would also drink different kinds of wine. They would even collect wine, but gun users like people who use a gun every day in some way, <laughs> are probably not so much wine drinkers, I'm thinking. <laughs> and so, you know, you wouldn't say, which, so which wine goes with which dish, like you would at a fine restaurant, you know, where you would go, okay, well, we're having uh, fish, uh, pepper, blah, 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 like, oh, well, it's fish, that's why wine. You know, we're having beef, blah, 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 blah. Oh, no, okay, well, that's probably some kind of red wine, you know, whatever. And um, I don't know why I bring up gun users. It's just, you know, a, a voter block. And, you know, we have a large voter block of pretty much every, every neighborhood now, so let's just pick one. You can pretty much Stevie Wonder it. And you would combine um, probably your favorite beer with your sp favorite sporting event. So, for example, um, or your favorite uh, firearm. Let's just go that far. You could be, be more specific. So, for example, um, uh, Coors Light would be stock car racing just because of the way the can looks. Or maybe the can looks the way it does because of stock car racing. You follow? Um, I grew up with these kinds of elements, you, you know, going off in my head. Um, Coors Earlier, those colors, real Coors, <laughs> Coors not light, <laughs> whatever that's called, those are the colors of going to college. Um, Guinness beer would be one of those long Benelli shotguns with the extra long barrel for duck hunting or whatever. You would, you would combine that beverage with that dish. Any of those new cool Czech machine pistols that we see in the... Uh, the uh, futuristic detective movies goes with just pretty much any fine pilsner. <laughs> and I learned to think this way as, uh, as a little kid, okay? Um, throughout all of this, the cigarettes to smoke were Marlboros and Cools and then ultimately Camels. This is my own personal history here, so, you know. <laughs> I personally sampled everything too. I'm not sure that I, you know, I'm uh, I'm happy about every calorie expended in that direction. But at least uh, I don't know, learn something from it.
Schlitz beer was really big in the 60s, as I recollect. And, you know, my memory is good. It's just short. Um, but that was fun just because of what it sounds like you're actually saying. And it's a fun word to say, like Blatz. Blatz was another big beer, I think, somewhere else in the country, but not where we were growing up. Uh, Schlitz was, uh, I guess, west of the Rockies. <laughs> and uh, I'm, I'm sure it's a, a shortening of a word like Schlitzenheimer or something like this. But uh, then Schlitz malt liquor. Malt liquor became something popular in the very early 70s. And I was never a really, uh, like a big drinker to the point where it was every night or, or uh, waking up sick in the mornings, but it's just so much a part of the culture that, you know, especially on television, you would see the ads like crazy. You saw ads for, you know, tobacco and cigarettes and everything else as well. So it's, you know, it's when you say your personal history with alcohol, this is what it means to me. <laughs> this is, um, you know, this is as poignant as uh, my homeroom teachers or Bugs Bunny, both of whom have a lot to do with my perspective on life in general at this point in time. Um, Schlitz Malt Liquor Ball was the drink of Van Halen, uh, almost to our demise <laughs> at some point in time. Ball, the Schlitz Malt Liquor Ball. When you want a change of pace, Ooh, get yourself a big bowl taste. Nobody makes malt liquor like Schlitz. You're so right, Dwight. It was the high school drink. It was easily available in a lot of the, uh, what you call it, in the, the liquor stores, you know, in the general grocery stores. And the advertisement was cool. You know, it was a huge bowl walking around in a liquor, a china shop sort of affair kind of effect, whatever. Um, we had Soul Beer, which was, I think it was in a red and white can. That was for a brief period of time. And then um, Pop Wines, as long as there was Bubbles. I guess Bubbles means like fun, <laughs> right? Effervescent is just a French word of saying Bubbles, <laughs> right? Yeah, I think, I'm, I'm learning, you know. So somebody somewhere said if we can put bubbles in wine without making it champagne, then maybe we have a market for this. And that being said, there was Boone's Farm, which was really popular. The pop wines were really huge. The hippie thing was kind of on the far edge of it. Uh, hippies started 1967, 66, somewhere around in there. And uh, up until uh, early 70s, you saw a lot of the same style, you know, the same kind of dancing and the same fringe and same uh, kind of haircuts and, you know, whatnot. But it started to become a little more urbane, a little more downtown, a little more gritty. And uh, with that in mind, uh, you know, the booze started to change. Throughout the late 60s, if you drank red wine, you drank uh, something that was called uh, Bally High. And Bally High only came in jugs. I don't ever remember getting a, a small bottle of Bally High. You always got a great big jug like that held two gallons of it. And I remember somebody teaching me how to actually drink from the jug communally is that you grasp it, you, you know, you have the, the little, you know, the finger or whatever, you put your finger through it and you get the bottle onto your forearm here. And that's what this muscle is still from. This, <laughs> this muscle right here. Now this one. <laughs> it's from 1968, it, it, it is. And uh, you put the bottle onto your forearm there and then lift like so using, you know, your, your forefinger to kind of guide things. And, and you put it down and then you put it down like so, which is different than when you go drinking at Sammy's Armenian, which is downtown here in New York City, where they take a vodka bottle and they put it inside a paper a uh, milk carton and fill it full of water and put it in the deep freezer and freeze it. Then before you get to the actual table, they tear the milk carton off and what you have is a bottle of vodka frozen into a big rectangular shoebox square sized thing of uh, ice. And it all seems very convenient because you pull it out 
and it has a towel around it, and you pour it very conveniently for the company, and it's all fun till that towel turns soaking wet. So now you have to throw the towel away, okay, like this, and pretty soon you have people in $1,500 Armani suits trying to hold the vodka bottle under their armpit like this, <laughs> or trying to bosom it and trying to pour it like this and spilling it all over everything. And now as the thing starts to melt away like a bad ceramic uh, class nightmare from high school, everybody's soaking wet like a bad television show appearance and they're all soaking wet and it's a lot of fun. It's a blast. I can't highly recommend it enough. You gotta go to Sammy's room. Anyways, um, ping-ponging around here, clearly. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, you had Boone's Farm, and then somebody else came in and said Zapple, which, I don't know, Boone's Farm had a little more hippie to it. There was a little more Stevie Nicks, a, a girl at least who would look like Stevie Nicks might run up to you and giggle and give you a flower in a Boone's Farm commercial. You might chase her into another commercial. I don't know. But uh, Zapple... It, it had a, it, it was fun, but it was pop, and I think they called these pop wines, and uh, it was just a way of putting uh, bubbles into wine without actually making it champagne. And in terms of making it champagne, you had uh, cold duck, which I don't think was qualified as champagne. I think it was just, I think it was just red wine that they had forced bubbles into. And Andre Cold Duck to keep things bubbling along. Greet the season and your friends with the best. Andre. Which, <laughs> which is clearly not champagne somehow. I think you have to grow champagne. You got to grow the bubbles. They actually have to be there, you know, by natural resource or something. You can't force the bubbles onto it or it's... Um, uh, it's something else. It's uh, uh, something wine or sparkling wine, I think is the actual term for it. And that being said, cold duck was really downtown stuff. You would always drink cold duck out of a plastic champagne glass, the kind that, you know, you have to screw together before the company gets there and the edge is too sharp always and you feel like you're going to cut your lip and you stand out in front of your little pad, you know, in front of your uh, one-piece thermal molded country plastic chair <laughs> with your slaps and your shorts on and drink uh, cold duck uh, uh, out of the fridge. You just keep refilling your plastic cup while the kids play on the hubcaps and the little barking collie dog strains at his chain leash, which is the title of my next live album. Nah, I'm kidding, actually. Um, <laughs> uh, I'm trying to go through the kinds of wine that we had. After pop wines, um, malt liquor really kicked in. I described Schlitz Malt Bull. Budweiser malt liquor had the best can, bar any, if my memory serves me well. It had the little uh, the Budweiser logo, but they were little gold ones that were on a black can. And, uh, you know, probably didn't sell well just because of the taste, but the can was killer. I should have gotten a suit that looked like that. I remember that one. From that point, you have two other varieties of uh, alcoholic drink. You have hard booze, which is, you know, scotch, whiskey, vodka, etc. And then you have sake. And sake is not wine. We always think of it as wine because it's served as wine at all your favorite Japanese eateries. But uh, it's not wine. It's rice. And that's a lot closer to grain. You know, if you're going to make whiskey out of grain, like wheat, like bread, whatever, then the hop, conceptually from that to a grain of rice, it almost looks the same. Is uh, uh, it's, it's not too much, you know, for most of us to make here. I always thought of it as wine, um, that, you know, it's clear, it's more often than not, it's got a kind of a transparent taste, a transparent palate to it, and it's served in conjunction with food, etc. But uh, it's not wine. It's stronger than wine. So you're kind of going to go from uh, beer to wine to uh, sake and then on to your hard booze there. Now hard booze came to play uh, a really 
important part in what Van Halen was doing, uh, not because of what it did for us, but, but for what it does for the audience to this moment. Um, uh, and I think we came in top five, somewhere in the top five, probably five and two thirds. <laughs> the last guys to get in just before like in those movies where the door is closing and somebody slides underneath <laughs> the door but we came in top five uh earnings uh for live shows in the last year and my first question was top five earnings you mean for beer sales or top five earnings for ticket sales because uh generally speaking uh van halen breaks the records at every live arena, every venue, every football stadium, uh, every bar and grill that features the music. You want to start pulling the tabs on the beer? Uh, you want to start pouring a lot of glasses of beer and a lot of pitchers of beer? Then uh, put Van Halen on this stereo. Pitchers of beer were very important in the interim right before Jack Daniels entered the picture. And pitchers of beer was what everybody would order when we were playing in the dance clubs. We were playing five 45 minute sets a night and they would have to use the pitchers for the wet t-shirt contest. I have described the wet t-shirt contest. And uh, uh, people would stack the pitchers up. As you finish drinking the beers, you don't like return the pictures right away. They're kind of like badges or, you know, monuments. I think is probably more of an appropriate term. And you would you start to stack up all of your uh, pictures and your empty glasses and everything, like a, a big sudsy stanky monument to how intoxicated you're getting <laughs> together. <laughs> which is, uh, you know, I guess the, someone who has the biggest mountain, inevitably one of the girls has to squeal and accidentally fall into the mountain of stuff and knock it to the floor, and everybody has to be irate. And whenever somebody knocks something to the floor and you're in a crowded bar and grill or whatever, and you hear <laughs> in the background, then uh, what you do is you don't even look, you yell, and stay out! Dave Roth. You're listening to DaveLeeRoth.com, The Roth Show. And stay out! While we're still on the subject of large quantities of beer contained in a single apparatus, let's pay a little bit of attention to the keg. Give me a keg of beer. You remember the keg. It was at every party that we ever went to as soon as the weather permitted and frequently not. I don't know about East Coast so much, but on the West Coast, Whenever somebody's parents split who had a house that was big enough, you had a kegger, a kegger, which means you were going to get a keg of beer. You've seen this in every kid movie ever about the truck pulling up too early and the parents going, why are you here? And he goes, I've got 14 kegs of beer, etc. for the party. You always have a keg of beer at the frat house and you have a keg of beer way, way, way down in Compton uh, at the backyard, uh, Hank, whatever. It's at both ends of the spectrum. And you got to get the big wash tub that you load up with blocks of ice or dry ice, but usually it's just blocks of ice that melt and get water everywhere, no matter what. And the beer, no matter how long you put it in the ice, will be room temperature or higher. No matter when you tap into it and drink it, it's going to be a little bit flat 
and it's going to be a little bit room room temperature, and it's always, it's going to be just not not past it by like a few days past it, but a few minutes past it. You know, you want to know how important a minute is? Ask the guy who just lost an Olympic hundred meter dash by a few seconds. A few minutes can make a big difference, and keggers always supplied dozens of people. No matter how many kegs you got, you would run out. It's just part of the, uh, it's biblical. You know, you, you know, even if you had 10 people and you ordered 40 kegs, I know, it doesn't make mathematical sense. We're not talking math here. We're talking belief. We're talking faith. Have faith in my belief. You will run out. And when you do, there will be a panic. <laughs> and everybody will start digging into their pockets and coming up with extra cash. And, uh, you know, it will all be given to some Herbie who will jump into his Volkswagen bug with another friend. And they're going to go try to locate the liquor store and uh, grab whatever. But that all, again, hails back to the kegger. And Van Halen uh, uh, started playing keggers, backyard parties that were just regular. We would play one, probably one a week, uh, probably three times a month, just shows like that. We considered them shows. There you are. There was no real stage frequently. There's no real lights frequently. You would borrow uh, enough cash and advance $50 in cash so you could uh, pull up in Bobby Hatch's pickup truck, which you would borrow for $20. And then you would get the uh, little spotlight, the trooperette, it was called, and you know, that would plug in, and you would set that up on the gardening shack somewhere, you know, and that was the light for the entire band, that one spotlight. That, those kinds of gigs, you'd charge a dollar a head for everybody to get in and see the band. We would routinely do, believe it or not, we'd do between two and four or five hundred people. They would charge a dollar at the gate, and it was all the beer you could drink until the, say it with me, the beer ran out. And no matter how much beer, it was always touted. The word would go around, yeah, man, he's got 22, he's got 37, he's got 44 kegs of beer and 14 people coming. It didn't matter. You would still run out. It's like a moment in a movie. You know, when, you know, like when Sherlock Holmes goes, "'Twas then I began to discern a pattern." Dum, bell rings. Dum, bell rings again. <laughs> and no matter what, there would have to be a flood of liquid. And the whole idea of somebody taking care of the keg, especially when it starts to run out, which is like, I don't know, it seems like 14 seconds after you tap it, you're starting to run out and it's just a little fizzy is starting to come out of the top of it. And, you know, the guy is working it and trying to pump it with air and get the last so, so that you can have that last little plastic glass of lukewarm flat. It's a totem at that point. It says, I am one of the gang. I am one with. And uh, we and Van Halen played those kegger parties, geez, for four and a half years. We used to play the beer bars as well, which is how I know how to build, you know, great, uh, you know, giant pyramids of, of uh, beer pitchers. I used to watch that from the stage, 545s a night. But uh, also, beer played a very important part. I'm, I'm not sure if they were actually coming to see the band or to drink the 44 kegs of beer. I'm still not sure. We're not sure here. Roth.com, but we the bomb. <laughs>